This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Uh, Kim's not going to be on the show this morning because she's on a call to London. And uh, you got to keep, keep those dollars, keep rolling back into Rich Dad. But anyway, we have, uh, I think, and all the shows are important, but a very important show today. And it's about, you know, in my, in my book, Fake, I talked about there was God's money, which is gold and silver, and then people's money, which is Bitcoin or cyber cryptocurrencies. And I really think it's important, especially for old guys like me, to understand the crypto world because that's the world that's coming into view right now. And us real estate and gold guys are kind of being phased out. So we've had him, we've had him as a guest before. It's Anthony Pompliano. He goes by Pomp. I call him Anthony. And he has one of the most fantastic shows going. And the reason it's fantastic is he explains the world of crypto better than anybody I've heard. So in many ways, there's this battle on today between the old guys and young guys. And the old guys have got their heads up their butts. You know, like <laughs> Buffett is anti-gold and anti-crypto. I'm going, give me a break. You know, I mean, how can you be anti-something? You know, get to know the pros and cons of everything. And, you know, he doesn't have to worry. He makes a lot of money. And then you have guys like Jim Records, a friend of mine, and he says crypto is dead. And so the reason I just love YouTube is I can crank along there. I can search. I'm looking for the other point of view. And that's how I came across Anthony. And um, so Anthony's point of view is valid. It's worth listening to. So he was on our program with um, my good friend. I can't remember his name right now, but he's New Orleans Gold Show. So I'm a gold guy and Anthony is the crypto guy. And it was a great show because we have similarities. So we're gonna go into the similarities and difference between gold, silver, God's money, and people's money, which is crypto. And so this guy is the leader right now, as far as I'm concerned, of explaining it to everybody. So welcome to the pro program again, Anthony. Yeah, Robert, listen, thanks so much for having me, and I appreciate the kind words. You uh, you, you have uh, educated millions and millions of people over the years, so uh, so it's fun to talk to you about this stuff. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I was talking to the staff here. You young guys are so smart today. You, you're so far down the road when it comes to financial education, intelligence, but more importantly is savvy. You're aware, you know, where the old guys are kind of close minded to your world. So that's why, you know, your site, what is the name of your site that people can go to? If you just Google uh, the pump podcast, we've got all, I think 300 plus interviews up there and uh, they can check that out. Um, or we've got a, a, a daily email that goes out uh, pompletter.com. Okay. So I look, you better check out this world of crypto, even if you're close minded, like, the old guys. All right. So Anthony, give us a little bit of your background and how you came into this world. And I mean, uh, as far as crypto. Yeah. So I uh, played football in college, uh, was in the U S army for a while. I uh, did a deployment overseas to Iraq, um, came back, built two small technology companies, uh, then went out and ran a number of product and growth teams at uh, Facebook uh, and Snapchat, and then uh, started investing full time at the end of 2015, and um, got started in uh, in Bitcoin and cryptocurrency uh, by building mining facilities. So, kind of you think of them as data centers, uh, but specifically running uh, hardware and software for uh, for running these networks. And uh, from there, pretty much decided to focus almost exclusively on it. And uh, and we get here today, where somehow. People are listening to uh, to me explain what uh, what all this is in and why it's important. So let me ask you this: you know, you had that program, uh, Open Letter to Ray Dalio, which I thought was enlightening. It was fabulous. What was the guy's name? Robert. Uh, Robert Breedlove. God, you guys are. I mean, you guys are so young and far down the road. But that was a. I, I highly recommend you check out that show with Robert Breedlove. It's called the Open Letter to Ray Dalio, the old guys. So what do you want to say to the old guys? You know, give, just, just, you can be politically incorrect here. What do you yeah. say to old guys who are closed minded? <laughs> well, well, so I think that what you've got to start with is uh, whenever you look at financial markets, um, especially a, kind of a macroeconomic standpoint, uh, there's problems and solutions, right? And, and actually what ends up happening is uh, precious metal 
uh, investors and cryptocurrency investors, they actually agree on most of the problems, yeah. right? So right. It, there, there's no secret that, hey, look, if you print a lot of money, the currency gets devalued, right? There's no secret that uh, there's high level of uh, corporate debt and, and the federal balance sheet's out of control and all of those things. Uh, for the most part, there's agreement. So I won't spend a ton of time on that. The question then is, what do you do? Right. And, and I think that uh, where there's agreement on the solutions is this idea of sound money principles. Right. right. And, and so whether it's gold, silver or Bitcoin, they all have various aspects of uh, sound money principles. The big question just becomes, you know, gold has, let's say, 5000 years of a track record. Bitcoin has 11 years. So, of course, there's going to be a hesitancy when it comes to something like Bitcoin. My kind of pitch to people is, look. The one thing that um, has a, uh, an advantage, I think, from Bitcoin or, or the most important advantage is there's full transparency and the verifiability of Bitcoin. So you know exactly how much exists, exactly how much is being produced every day and kind of the supply side of the supply and demand equation is known with 100% certainty. And so it's just a matter of uh, generational divide, right? Older folks usually aren't used to kind of touching all the digital technologies. Younger people are. Um, and, and so you kind of pick your asset, but they both have sound money principles. Uh, and I actually think both of them will do well coming out of, uh, out of this economic crisis. Thank, you know, fantastic. You know, for, for the old guy like me, it was seven, 1971 when Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard. And that's where you and I line up is because when the dollar went off the gold standard, August 15th, 1971, you know, they could print as much as they wanted. And today they're printing in trillions. You know, before it was millions, then it went to billions and now it's trillions. And just, you know, a couple of days ago, the Mall of America, one of the biggest shopping centers in the world, just said they missed two payments of $1.2 billion a month. Imagine having a mortgage of 1.2 billion. So they missed two payments. The question is who were those payments going to? And who's going to bail them out? And the Fed has to bail them out. In my opinion, they're going to have to print more money. And would you agree with that theory? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, whenever you get in these situations, that there's two things that are important to understand, right? I, I always say that uh, the U.S. economy is addicted to stimulus the same way that a crack addict is addicted to crack right? Yeah. You literally can't function without it. And, and we saw that when they tried to do some quantitative tightening, um, you know, back in 2018. And then the second piece of this is uh, any time that you get into these recessionary periods, they only have two tools, right? The central bank can only um, manipulate the interest rate or they can print more money. And so they're using the tools they have, but they've already gone to 0% interest rates. They claim they're not going to go negative. So it's just a matter of how much do you print, right? And, and, well, and uh, let me add, so let's, let's go bigger picture. You know, I think most people know that they just don't know what to do and they don't know why you guys, you younger guys, so enthusiastic on crypto. I mean, even Max Kaiser, he's not as young as you guys, but he calls himself the reincarnation of Satoshi. You know, going, <laughs> I just, I just crack. He's not even Japanese. I should be Satoshi. <laughs> but well, I, well, I'll he, tell you the, the thing that really, really woke me up, and it was thank to, thanks to you because I call Anthony when I have you know confusion on stuff. Was this having? Now the reason having is important is because at the same time, let's get this. This is why I converted over to Bitcoin. This is my reason and. It was Anthony that cleared it up for me. Is that at the same time that Fred, the Fred, the Fed is printing trillions of dollars, Bitcoin is tightening. So Bitcoin's getting harder and the dollar's getting softer. Would you? go into more detail on that distinction. Yeah. So if you take quantitative easing, right, that is literally uh, the Fed printing money and flooding the market with more dollars, right? It, it creates uh, a, a higher degree or a higher number of circulating supply of dollars. So that's quantitative easing. Now, the opposite of that quantitative hardening or quantitative tightening would be them actually taking dollars out of circulation, right? And yep. so what ends up happening in Bitcoin is something that looks like quantitative hardening. So there's 21 million Bitcoin that were, have ever been created. Every 10 minutes in the beginning, 50 of them were distributed into the circulating supply. That programmatically was cut in half four years later. 
So after four years of 50 Bitcoin every 10 minutes, it got cut to 25. It then went for four more years. It then got cut to 12 and a half. And just earlier this month in May, it went from 12 and a half to 6.25. So the way to think about this is uh, previously, um, earlier this year, there was 1800 Bitcoin a day that was getting created and entered into the uh, uh, circulating supply. Now there's only 900. So if you think about the opposite of quantitative easing is quantitative hardening, literally you're getting an artificially capped supply that is becoming harder and harder to get on a daily basis. And so as long as demand stays the same or goes up for that asset, the US dollar value should appreciate. And so the key piece to this, again, why are young people gravitating towards this asset is one, it's programmatic, right? Compare that to the the Fed. People are are betting trillions of dollars in the market on are they going to print more? Are they not? What's the interest rate decision going to be, right? All that kind of stuff. With Bitcoin, we know with 100% certainty what's going to happen. And then the second piece is that it's programmatic, right? So nobody can go in and manipulate it. And so in a world where uh, any TV station you turn on, everyone's arguing over what the Fed's doing, right? In this world, nobody can manipulate the market, right? There's nobody who can change that programmatic monetary supply schedule. Well, so, so, so let, me use, let me use all guys' language here. The Fed is centralized banking. So central is also communist, you know, you know, command and control of a central government. That's communism. Whereas what Bitcoin, gold and silver are, they're, they're, they're not controlled by anybody. So one of the reasons back in 72 when I started buying gold was because the Fed couldn't mess with it. They do mess with it to some degree, but they can't print a lot of it. You know, and that's what I don't like about saving dollars. So when... So explain why it's programmatic, but why I call it people's money because there's no, there's not one person like Jerome Powell, the Fed chairman, who can say today it's going to do this, tomorrow it's going to. Do it. It's already been planned out for years, right? Exactly how many coins are coming out. Yeah, I mean, look, if you look at, let's say, the ECB Board of Governors, there's like 25 people that go in a room and make a decision, right? The Fed, I think it's, you know, about 12 people go in a room and they make a decision. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I've got a friend who always says there's 12 people making the decision for a minimum of 330 million people's money, right? That just kind of doesn't sit well with younger people. And so when you look at something like Bitcoin, there's computer code that was written. That computer code can only be changed if more than 50% of the people on the network agree to change it. Now, as you know, when you have millions of millions of people who are all trying to coordinate something, nothing gets done, right? And so that code's never gonna get changed. It's gonna stay how it is. And if there was a change, everyone would see it happen. So you so not you only get- completely decentralized. Completely decentralized. The old guy system is centralized and a bunch of old guys control who gets the cash, right? Yeah. And, and, and a way to look at it is uh, the U.S. dollar is a sovereign currency. It's backed by a, by a nation and every nation has their own currency and they're all manipulating them. Right. We're seeing everything uh, across the world. Everyone's manipulating their currencies. Bitcoin is the separation of state and money. It's the first time we've seen a currency right outside of something like gold. Right. Where now all of a sudden no single country can manipulate the monetary policy. And so what I think is going to happen over time is every currency will be digital. There'll be a digital dollar, digital euro, digital yen, yuan, et cetera. So the technology will all be the same. The competition will happen at that monetary policy level. And I personally believe that the separation of state and money will become viewed as the superior monetary policy, just as gold for many, many decades has been seen as the superior store of value because of those sound money principles. Correct. And that, point here is we're going to get, we're going to go to a break, but there's a whole bunch of stuff we've got to understand here is that, uh, when, well, what was I thinking when the United States comes out with a crypto dollar, that's the question I want to, and I want to talk to you about Libra, I think what Facebook is doing. Mm-hmm. And that's why your program with, uh, Robert Breedlove and your open letter to Ray Dalio, I recommend everybody, you know, tune in to your, your podcast station, and listen to that um, program. I mean, Breedlove just nails it out. I mean, he just, and it, it takes a while. We only, we only have 40 minutes here, but R- Breedlove just nails it. And he explains why Bitcoin is superior to all other cryptos coming out. Cause that was my biggest concern. If, if you can print a crypto, why can't I print, print a crypto? You know what I mean? Yeah. Then it's, it's, it's decentralized, but it's again, printing money. So we come back, we'll be going more with Anthony Pompliano 
And really why you old guys go better listen to what he's saying. That's <laughs> that's really why gold, silver, and Bitcoin are what I save. And because I don't trust my government. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. You can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android and YouTube. And please leave, leave us a review or comments. All of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. We archive them for one reason. We make no recommendations. That way I recommend you buy gold, silver, or Bitcoin. We're purely educational. But being educational, we, all, we also know that repetition is how we learn best. So if you listen to this program one more time, your intelligence will go twice. You'll understand this better, why you should maybe be considering Bitcoin if you already haven't. Also, you can have your friends, family, and especially business partners listen to it. Because all of you guys out there who are taking those stimulus checks and saving it, you're the biggest losers on planet Earth. So I guess today is Anti Pompliano, and he's the pomp, and he is, he is my go-to guy when I want to understand his, the young guy's world of Bitcoin. So really quick, let's get into this because, again, your, your, your program, Open Letter to Ray Dalio and Ray Love, you did a fantastic job of taking very complex and dumbing it down an old guy like me could understand it. But what's going to happen if the U.S. comes out with a crypto and Facebook already has Libra? What's what's your what goes through your brain? Yeah. So first of all, every country is going to do this, right? They're already talking about it at the central bank level. So we're going to see a digital dollar, digital euro, digital yen, yuan, all the way down the line. Every currency will be digitized over time, and that's because there's certain advantages from a technology standpoint, right? It's cheaper, it's faster to move, all that kind of stuff. Not only though will we see nation states do this, we will also see corporations do it. So Facebook obviously has Libra, others are, have contemplated and will launch their own currencies. The competition though is not going to be between digital currencies and non-digital currencies. Everything's going to be digital. The competition is going to be at that monetary policy level. And so when the dollar is released as a digital dollar, the monetary policy doesn't change, right? They're still going to have an inflationary quantitative easing driven currency. When Libra launches, Libra now is actually launching a digital dollar, a digital euro, et cetera. So they're going to adopt the monetary policy of different nations. The only monetary policy that is in direct contrast, meaning it's 180 degree difference from the digital dollar or digital euro is Bitcoin. It's a separation of state and money. It's a deflationary structured currency that has a disinflationary monetary uh, supply schedule. And so what you're seeing is this great divide, and, and it frankly happens somewhat in a generational divide, but also in kind of an economic divide where people are saying, I want to have a currency in which it gets more valuable over time rather than less valuable. And I want the transparency and the predictability of a monetary policy that is written into code rather than 12 people go in a room and they make a decision based on how they're emotionally feeling that day. And so that's why your program with uh, Robert Breedlove, the open letter to Ray Dalio, please listen to it because it's really well done, extremely well done. So why are you so bullish on Bitcoin if there's Ethereum and other, other, other garbage going around there and everybody's getting into it. And you know, like I, I was watching this one guy, he says, everybody's now jumping on the bandwagon. This is the hot new coin, hot new coin. When you see stuff like that, what goes through your head? Yeah, so, so I think that there's um, a really, really key piece, right? Is there's all these crypto assets or crypto tokens. There's actually a very small number, number of them that are trying to be money or a currency. Most of them are trying to be, you know, digital gift cards or access to different networks and kind of all this, you know, super exotic type applications of blockchain. What we're talking about here is money. And the key piece to understanding money is it's a belief system, right? So the only reason why somebody accepts a dollar from me is because they and I both believe that it has value. Well, when it comes to digital currencies and kind of the separation of state and money, there's really only one that matters and that's Bitcoin. And the reason why it's the only one that matters is it's the first one that people have bought into that is fully decentralized, that has no owner and is uh, transparent and programmatic. And so my belief is that if Bitcoin is not successful, right? If the separation of state and money does not work, there will never be a separation of state and money. And the reason why I say that is because money is a belief system. And so just like if you're, let's say a citizen in Zimbabwe and your government blows up the currency and then they come back and say, hey, Robert, you know what? Sorry about that. Here's our next one, right? Here's V2. You don't say, hey, I trust you, right? You're like, I'm not falling for this trick again. So same thing here, I think is Bitcoin is the first one to really capture the belief 
And that belief system is the most important, most defendable thing around Bitcoin. So, and so, so, you, so, so let me go into it one more time because you guys, Robert Breedlove and the open letter Ray Dalio, you guys go into that with precision. So would you explain to me how they can go and pick up that site, that, that very explanation, that, that one broadcast of yours? Yep. So if you, if you literally just Google uh, the Pomp podcast um, and then just type in uh, Ray Dalio, uh, it'll come up as the, uh, as the title. You can click on it and, uh, and listen to it. Um, and, and we basically cover the, uh, the idea that, uh, look, most of the smartest investors in the world they're like 80, 90% of the way there. We agree on all of the problems, right? Everyone who's now asking, what do I do? Five years ago, nobody was saying Bitcoin. Now there's a couple of people, right? Paul Tudor Jones recently came out and he took 2% of his assets and put it into Bitcoin, right? So you get some of these people doing it. My guess is five to 10 years from now, it will be what I call a consensus uh, investment, right? Right now it's contrarian, small number of people do it. The majority doesn't do it over time though. I think that'll flip and you'll have the majority of people doing it. And then you'll have a small minority that doesn't participate. Okay. So this is my bitch. Okay. Paul Tudor Jones, people may not know who he is, but he is like, he's bigger than Ray Dalio in my book. Dalio may be a richer, but Tudor Jones, Paul Tudor Jones is a stud. I mean, he's a smart guy, kind of low key. And, um, He's a billionaire. How the heck can he buy 2%? You guys, I go to Coinbase, which you guys recommend this. I go to Coinbase and they limit me to 25,000. Why do they do that? I mean, guys like me who want to move a lot more money, 25,000 is boring. I mean, why do they, why, why, why is Coinbase doing that? Yeah. So uh, Paul Tudor Jones, he, he's got about $5 billion to his net worth. He managed about 22 billion. So estimates are he's probably put 250 to $500 million in. Right. Not so he, $25 a shot, man, something. No like way, that. no way. So, so there, there's a number of ways to put really, really big money, hundreds of millions of dollars. You can do it through OTC desks um, and things like that. But for the average investor, what you can basically do is there, there's a number of exchanges in the U.S. Um, where you can go, you can sign up for an account uh, and they basically start you off with a small amount. And then gradually you can um, ask for higher limits, right? And the reason why they do that is because this is very similar to the traditional banking system where there's a lot of regulation. Right. So, so people think that crypto isn't regulated. These U.S. based exchanges, companies like Coinbase, Gemini, Kraken, BlockFi, et cetera, they actually have very, very high levels of regulation. And so they're there to do KYC and AML and kind of make sure that there's no bad actors. Um, after you are able to get that twenty five thousand dollar limit, you can apply to get it higher and higher. Uh, so that's what people should do. Okay. What's what's KYCL? Uh, KYC and AML is a uh, know your customer and uh, anti money laundering uh, rules. So it's basically the, uh, the legacy financial system uh, as part of their surveillance of the financial system and of citizens. Now uh, they require this information uh, for uh, banks or financial institutions to know about you. So they know who you are, where the money came from and just basically make sure you're not doing bad things. Well, because you know, you, uh, Bitcoin got the reputation of being associated with Silk Road early and Silk Road was the dark side of the web, right? Yeah. Has, has that been cleaned up or is that still exist? It's always existing, but you know, yeah. So, so the, here's the way I think about it. Right. So there, there's two key components. One is every great technology is first adopted by criminals and drug dealers. Right. And, and the reason why I say that is because they're the ones who are always having to innovate to stay ahead of the law enforcement. Right. So yeah. beepers, cell phones, the internet, all that stuff was first adopted by kind of the bad actors. And then it became mainstream. No different with Bitcoin. Started out with bad actors to some degree, and now it's become mainstream. But the second piece is also don't forget there was $2 trillion of the US dollar that was uh, laundered last year, right? That's the estimates out of uh, the UK. So $2 trillion. The crypto market cap is less than 400 billion. Right. To give you Jeez, a sense. In the bucket. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, an asset like Bitcoin, that's called 200 billion or so, right. Literally is one tenth the size of how much U S dollars is laundered every year. And so okay. when you start to look at this, it, it's like, look, let's worry about the, you know, tracking down all those bad people using the U S dollars rather than the couple of bad actors uh, that are using Bitcoin. Right. Good point. So we're running out of time, but what would you, what other reasons would you say to people young and old, why they better understand Bitcoin, especially because again, your program on pop podcast with open letter Ray Dahlia with Robert Breedlove explains it in much more detail, but what else would you say to people? Why you're so bullish? Oh, one more thing is what is your prediction on the ultimate dollar value of a Bitcoin? Cause it's yes. your, 
Just finish this thing up strong, man. Do your sales job on it. <laughs> so the, look, the, the whole pitch, I think, behind Bitcoin is just, you have to understand how money works, right? And the U.S. financial system is predicated on 50% or more of people not understanding how money works. If you understand how it works, you know that the dollar is going to get less valuable over time. Bitcoin has the exact opposite monetary policy and should get more valuable over time. So once you understand that, it's pretty simple. In terms of what that price looks like, you know, I'm on the record publicly saying that I think uh, Bitcoin will be worth over a hundred thousand dollars by the end of 2021. So you're you're expecting a, a ten time jump on it. Yeah, and 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 that would track to a very similar growth rate to what it showed over the last 10, 11 years, right? So, so anytime you have something that's very innovative and disruptive, you get lots of volatility. If you are a longer term investor, you've, you can stomach those big drawdowns, but you also get the volatility to work in your advantage on the way up. And so I think that's what's going to happen with Bitcoin. Okay. Anything else you want to come to, um, man, you, I, just this big, the big thing that you sold me on, which I didn't understand was the having, or I call it the hardening while the dollar and all currencies are softening any fiat car fake money is softening anything else that we should know about. I, I think the biggest thing is uh, a lot of um, understanding money and currencies is just around the structure. It's actually very simple. One currency gets less valuable over time. The other gets more valuable over time. And uh, you know, look, don't go take all your money and go put it into one single asset. But if you size the risk correctly in your portfolio, uh, I think that it can be quite valuable. And so, you know, risk comes with every investment, do your own research. But, uh, but I tend to think that Bitcoin's going to uh, be, be kind to a lot of people. So let me ask one more question then. Why do you call it, why do you say 100? You know, uh, Rickards has the reason gold's gonna go to 50K. What's your reason for Bitcoin going to 100K? So there are many, many people who are way smarter than me. And what they've basically done is they've taken stock to flow ratio uh, models that you would use in the gold world, right? Similar with the sound money principles. And they've overlaid it with uh, the Bitcoin price movements. And what you find is over time, it's become more and more accurate. And so if you think of what is that goes into that, you basically are modeling supply and demand. With gold, you pretty much know how much gold is coming online every day. You pretty much know how much is out there. Uh, and then you predict what demand will be. Well, with this, what you're doing is, you know, with 100% certainty, the supply side, so you have to predict uh, the demand side. And that stock to flow ratio has been very, very accurate in the past. And that's basically what tells you by the end of 2021, you'll see a $100,000 price. Good. And the reason I, I really I enjoyed that program, open letter to Ray Dalio, is you point out that you just put Dalio's principles back on them, you know, like transparency and trust and ruthless truth telling, whatever it is, you guys just put it back on them. Anyway, you know, I, I really, um, it was, it's an eye opening palm podcast. So anyway, anyway, Anthony, thank you very, very, very much for your support and, uh, look forward to having you back on the program again. Absolutely. You're doing a fantastic job, Robert. Thanks so much for having me. And we'll come back. We'll be having a final words on gold, silver, and Bitcoin, God's money and the people's money. We'll be right back. Hello, 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 Robert Kiyosaki, the rich dad radio show, the good news and bad news about gold, silver, and Bitcoin. And once again, listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes, Android, or YouTube, or yeah, YouTube. And please leave a comment when you listen. All of our pro programs are archived at Rich Dad Radio because repetition is how we learn. If you listen to this program again, you'll learn twice as much. But more importantly, you can take this to friends, family, and business associates who really need to come up to speed on cryptocurrencies. Because, you know, as an old guy, it's taken me a while to get onto it. And you know, I, I got, I, I never got burned, but at one time I was, I bought three Bitcoin at 20,000 each at the top of the market. And thank God, I don't know what happened to the guy I bought them from, but he disappeared. So I never transacted. So I still have my 20, 60,000 bucks, but I'm back in buying it because Anthony Pompiliano is the person I call. And again, his pomp podcast and that open letter to Ray Dalio with Robert Breedlove is worth listening to because this guy Breedlove is boy, he's technical on this stuff and it's very simple to understand, but I've now gone through it three times. I'm still doing my best to absorb it. So anyway, we're an education company. So I could complete this whole program. Once again, Kim is on a phone call to London, organizing people there, but I'm the old guy. I was in 782. I started buying gold and I have millions today. I just keep buying it because I don't, what happened in 71 is I stopped trusting the US dollar because it's fake money. When Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard, it became fake. But the other side of it is I've always worked on my financial education. I don't need money. 
And we have a new book coming out this fall. It's called Infinite Returns, Money for Nothing, Gold, Silver, Bitcoin for Free. Because that's what's happening, guys. Money is for nothing today. You know, with ZERP, zero interest rate policy, and they're printing trillions of it. Why the hell are you working for it? Why are you saving it? So the, it's a book, The Infinite Returns. Watch for it. It's probably late October, early November. Infinite Returns. All of my advisors on it. Kim's on it. And we're, we're talking about how we individually come up with infinite returns. So you never need money. It really is the strangest phenomenon. It's a very spiritual book. I get, I get excited when I think about making money for nothing. You know that song by Dire Straits, Money for Nothing, Chicks for Free? They both appeal to me. Anyway, so uh, I'll give the old guys what I was taught about money. Money is, number one, a unit of account. Okay, what that means, you can count it. Like, I couldn't count gold nuggets because they're gold nuggets, but when they broke a gold, gold into a Kruger and a U.S. A US dollar, a U.S. silver, what do you call them? Anyway, more, and you could measure it. That was the biggest thing. So a gold nugget's not worth much, but when you break it down to a gold coin or a silver coin, it becomes more money. Another thing is a store of value. And that's the biggest thing that Bitcoin has because of the halving. You know, they're, they're making it harder while the dollar is technically getting softer and the other condition for money is exchangeability. Now that's the limitation, in my opinion, just my opinion, is with Bitcoin is it's hard to exchange. I can't go to you know the supermarkets. I got some Bitcoin. They don't take it, but more and more people are, and I think they. I, I'm quite sure they'll solve that problem. Where you'll be able to take a fraction of a Bitcoin and say, you know, here's one tenth of a Bitcoin. Just buy buy me a car with it. But that's coming. So the three things that make up money: unit of count or unit of measure, a store of valuable, and it's exchangeable. So the reason I'm into gold, silver, and Bitcoin for all three, but the most important thing is a store of value. As I said earlier, you know, just the uh, J.C. Penney's is closing. Neiman Market declared bank bankruptcy. The biggest mall, the Mall of America, missed two mortgage payments, one two one point two billion dollars each. And where is that? Where was that one point two billion supposed to go to? You know, who's who's got who got screwed? And who's going to bail them out is the Fed. They're going to print more money to bail them out. So that's why I don't trust the U.S. dollar. If you understand that, you'll understand why guys like me are gold, silver, and Bitcoin. Now, there's other, they're going to print a lot of other coins, but that's why you got to be prepared because there's any, any place, any subject, there's a lot of fakes, crooks, and scumbags out there. Thank you for listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show, and thank you to Anthony Pompliano and the Pomp Podcast. 